<laughs> hey guys, my name is Sean Brown, owner of SB Solo Manufacturing. This is my girlfriend, Nina, where you may have seen her on my Instagram page, SB Solo Co, where we do uh, some videos. It's a new page, but I love making videos and we've done a few like serious videos, just everything about machining. So it's, it's pretty fun. And this is another fun video that Practical Machinist has asked us to, to do. So I think it's gonna be a great, a great little video about basically this little 896 square foot shop is it little or big? It's massive. Yeah, massive. Massive to her because she's like this tall. To me, not <laughs> so one. much. So instead of showing you the machines, I think it's everybody's seen a machine. I'm going to show you the deep dive of what I would want to see in a shop tour because, you know, custom fixturing, um, tooling, anything that makes me efficient as a one man show, especially if someone was like getting on their own to go into a garage shop or just start their own shop, it's going to be very informative, and we're going to really, we're going to really get into that. So. Before I do that, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my background in machining, what I used to do, um, and then you know how I got here and quit the day job. And then Nina is- I'm not gonna listen to that, so Nina's bye. not gonna listen to that. I guess we could start with my dad. I'm a second generation machinist. My dad was a machinist, a manual machinist for a long time. He's always had a shop since I remember him. Growing up, my brother and I, like eight and nine, um, we would we would go to my dad's shop at night. We'd like roller skate around this 40,000 square foot shop. I don't know how we didn't get hurt. I remember they had their own anodized tanks and we would throw stuff in there to make it fizz. Uh, didn't tell them about that till later on in life. My dad taught me how to weld. I was welding when I was in fifth grade, you know, not very good, but welding. And then I ended up making um, uh, throwing stars and I was selling them on the playground like in sixth grade. And then I got caught and the principal called my dad and he's like, okay, do you have any more? I'm like, yeah, it's behind the dresser. I, I got scolded for it, but I know he was pretty proud. <laughs> so that was kind of the start of my, machining career is in uh, sixth grade. My dad always wanted me to work in his shop, but I didn't I didn't really want to go that route. I wanted to do so, some other stuff. And plus, I wasn't really sure about myself. Horrible at book work. I flunked math. I barely got past pre-algebra. And everybody's like, you want to be a machinist, you have to, have to be good at math. And in the real world aspect, I was doing algebra all the time. I just couldn't do story problems. So that kind of knocked me down a little bit. But by the time I got out of high school, I realized like that was my passion. I definitely wanted to do it. My boss would always laugh at me because I would turn on like a $30,000 machine just to use the calculator because it had the trig and everything <laughs> and all the geometry. I'm like, hey, I got to do what I have to do. You know, if I have to oh, fire this machine up to do it, I mean, I had to figure it out. And it's kind of why I got into the CAD stuff earlier on is, you know, trying to figure out my angles. I figure out the profile and then you would just program in the lathe or the mill and, you know, just do. And so I got a job uh, in a pattern shop. I was just a grunt. Um, just polishing ejector pins for Peterbilt molds and stuff. It was awful. And then I got another job that I spanned 20 years at and we started with three people and I was the third employee. And then it, it was like 3,500 square feet and then it amounted into a 60,000 square feet with 160 people I think it topped out at. So basically when I first got that job, I uh, was stuck on an old lunar lander. I call it lunar lander. It was an old Haas, like a 1993 Haas, but it was shaped like a lunar lander. And so I had to program by hand. I had to just read the book, figure out how to program by hand and did that. And by, I mean, I was already running manual machines. I ran manual machines all the time. So early on, I was on a manual lathe and I was making some pretty critical parts. And he's like, don't let Sean do that. He's not qualified to do that. And I ended up doing him really well. Well, since I did him so well, I was stuck on a lathe for the next seven years. <laughs> that being said, there was one time he had me take parts uh, to a vendor in an anodized shop. And I ended up getting there and I, realized I didn't have them. I left them on the top of my car. And when I pulled out, they fell off the top of my car. So I called him up. He goes rushing down there and he's like, they landed in the street and got ran over. So my boss actually had to like, uh, remachine those parts that weekend and, uh, get them to the customer. I didn't ever have to deliver parts anymore. <laughs> so the last 13 years of working there, I worked on a cell controller an MAS on the Makino with a D 500 five axis. So I was the sole programmer for the five axis. I ran the whole cell controller and I learned a lot of stuff doing that. I mean, I was pulling my hair out back then. So with that company, basically it was all semiconductor and, uh, like Rockwell Collins and lamb Novellus back then. And then when I left there, I went to uh, aerospace company, strictly aerospace. It was basically big machinery, like big Matsura, MAM, I think H100, big T1 Makinos. And we did a lot of the, you know, Lockheed, Northrop, uh, Lockheed missile defense parts, you know, for the F-35 and missile parts and, you know, hogging big stainless steel, 17.4, uh, did a lot of 17.4, did a lot of... Uh, um, titanium and a lot of 70, 50, um, hog outs. So just stuff that 
just brought me to another level. Like it was super difficult. Like certain things would take like two weeks to uh, program at my last job. And like there's one program or part that I did, it probably took me five months straight to program. So pretty diversified. And I've got a lot of plastic under my belt, especially doing semiconductor. I don't ever want to do plastic. I can't say I'm doing plastic, but you know, if I have to, I guess I'll do it. All right, let's go into the shop tour. So this is my catch all area. Basically where I store everything that I don't use on a daily basis, I have to pull it out to use it. It's kind of annoying, but you got, that's what you have to do with 896 square feet. And if I had like 900 square feet, the extra 400 or four feet, I probably could put a brother right over here and put another machine in here. <laughs> but for the time being, until I get a bigger shop, that's how I have to do it. So basically I have a Burr King. Um, this thing is awesome. I love it. I'm running the Haas wheels. They work so good, they're cheap. Just good enough for what I need. Uh, Wilton uh, belt sander, nothing special. I'm running this, uh, using this uh, hoist by Haas. It's such a good hoist. I, I was a little bit questionable about the bearing uh, wheels, but it makes it so easy to spin and maneuver the, the, the stuff that I'm trying to put in there. Cause I tried to hoist before, like putting my five axis training in. It took me like almost four hours cause it was so cumbersome. This is like super fast. I love it. Plus the actuator, the valve, the bleed off is so good. Like it doesn't, if you break it loose, it doesn't slam on the table. You know, you can really adjust it like really nice and it just like eases down. And then I have my Millermatic. I don't use this often. I'm not a fab shop. I do it for my own personal projects. And I used to have a sinker wave. Um, I mean, I've welded, I've been welding since I was 10 years old. My dad taught me, but he's got the whole setup. So it's just easier to go to my dad's dad's place. Like, hey dad, can you weld it? Um, instead of me even welding it. So, yeah. And of course, fire extinguisher, class D. If you're gonna do titanium or anything like that, you better make sure you have a class D. Um, I almost caught a laid on fire at an old job and man, it was so close. I mean, it was, it was some flames. Luckily I had my gloves on already ready to pull the nest out and it just took off and I couldn't get, the coolant was going, obviously it doesn't, it doesn't care. So I pulled it out, got on the ground, stomped on it, got it out, but I was blind for a good two hours. I couldn't see anything. So it's good to have that. You know, I plan on doing titanium in my lathe, so I just want to make sure that I don't catch it on fire. Um, so yeah, that's the little area. But what I really want to show you is the phase converter because that's the first thing you're going to need when you get a machine. So here we go. All right, guys, before I got a machine, I had to get a phase converter because I didn't have three phase from the street, which most people don't for starting a little garage shop. So this is what I got. The Nimbus 2000. Not really. This is a phase technologies. Uh, I don't even know the model number, but it's a 20 horsepower output, I believe. Um, I've had it for six years. It's ran two VF2s on it. Maximum output was 28 amps. It's been a great, a great phase converter. So how this actually works is that I have 200 amps coming in from the, from the street, regular power. Uh, I have a 100 amp breaker. 100 amp goes to this, and then it pops out around 60 amps um, of three phase. And overall, I have never had a problem like running. I had the lathe pop on about, and it hit about 55 amps. And uh, it got a little close, but and obviously the machines are rated for a lot higher, but I've never seen it do that. I think if all the machines went on all at once, I'd probably have a low voltage alarm, but I haven't seen it yet. So crossing fingers, knock on vinyl. I think we'll uh, be okay for at least, at least while I'm in this facility. But if you get one, get one of these digital readouts right here. It's not, a, it's like only $150 extra but it shows the amperage. So when you're running, you can see how many amps that you're actually using. And that way, if you had two machines on here and you had an extra, you know, 30 amps to go, you know, you know, you can put another machine on it. So it's really nice to see your voltages or your amps. You can also see voltages too. So you're like your legs, it has like voltages for each leg that you're running out. And so when you have that, that's a lot easier to um, figure out which, uh, leg to put it on your bus bar in your machine. And also rotary versus uh, digital. I've heard digital is better on power surges. I've had uh, lost power plenty of times, didn't do anything to my machines. They're still running great. The old Haas honestly can run off 110, I swear. <laughs> that thing just keeps running, so yeah. All right, on the next thing. Whew, out of breath, because I had to run across my huge shop. All right, so here's my air compressor. It's a rotary compressor. Uh, I had an older rotary compressor that I used. It was on three phase and it pulled 30 amps right from the beginning on the startup. It was so heavy that it would actually alarm out my uh, newer Haas uh, low voltage. So it was just pulling so much from the, the phase converter. Um, 
it was just a massive draw. So what I did was I bought this uh, Solar ST4, and the unique thing about this is it's on 220. It only runs 220, so it's, I don't even have it on my phase converter, uh, my phase converter panel. So yeah, it's been great. It's also got the regulator in it, so it actually regulates when it turns on and off. You know, it goes in conserve mode, which is really nice. But the one thing is that if you have a small shop, you'll never ever have to use uh, your heater. If you, I mean, even if you have a heater in the winter, it'll get super hot in here because it runs like 185 degrees. It's so hot. I wish I could vent it out, but um, the noise is a big issue. I'm afraid noise will get out. And I'm not sure how to combat that. So what I do is just open the door and fan out the air and cycle it once the machines are kind of stalled. And it's one of those things I have to do being in a residential. So. Yeah, so we have this, the awesome compressor. And then we have, the, well, this is my old compressor. Um, Two-stage two piston compressor. <laughs> so this is my piston compressor, and I use it as a tank, so I welded a bung in it, and the tank obviously has a drain in the bottom, and so I bought a, a timer off Amazon, and what this does is it, it uh, times when it releases the air and hits the actuator and releases all the water uh, out of the drain. And so I can put it for a certain amount of seconds and a certain amount of time frame for this to pop on every day. So I have it on um, the lowest, I think it's like 30 minutes uh, for five second purge. And that works really great. I think it was only a hundred dollars off Amazon. It's been working for almost six years. So that's an awesome thing, but yeah, had to get rid of that pissing compressor because it's basically like, you know, putting a saucepan over your head and smacking it with a ball peen pan hammer a hundred times. This, this is not, it's, it's, it's not an option. <laughs> so here we have my Ingersoll Rand um, um, air dryer. It's, it's great, it does everything I need to do. Keeps the air out of lines. Actually, there is air in my lines. <laughs> this thing works flawless. It doesn't have any problems with it. To be honest, I have a little air, a water separator up here, an air separator, a water separator. And I release that every morning and I'll come in here and sometimes the Ingersoll Rand uh, water dryer is on conserve mode because it doesn't have anything to dry. So it's been pretty good. All right, what next? Nina's gonna show us the inspection area. I know about all these tools. Yeah, I know you do. I do. First drawer, calipers. Hate them very much because they don't make left-handed ones and I am a lefty. Um, and Sean told me that I just need to learn. What are, what are these? These? Yeah. Also calipers. No. All of this is calipers. <laughs> All of it? <laughs> Everything. Calipers. Micrometers. Dint -dint 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 -dicators. <laughs> <laughs> Indicators. Okay, this is for Nina. We can measure Nina. But she's not allowed to use it because you have to be five foot two. Five foot two to even run this caliper. I also, yeah. I don't grow that much in a year. Yeah, this is so. your caliper. No. This is Swiss cheese. All right, what's the next one? These are deburring tools. Yeah, so we have a lot of deburring stuff in here. All I right. knew that. Next drawer. I just want you to know that he did not coach me on any of these. these is, this is my knowledge. This is for cutting your clay. Have some air nozzles, you know, get in those small holes, little small nozzles, some tooling balls. Every once in a while, I'll need a tooling ball, probably every once in five years. These are... Parallels. Yeah. Okay, bye. That's for dentistry. A baby hammer. Calipers again. The most important tool is in the bottom drawer. Yeah, the label maker. Not a label maker. I love this thing. <laughs> the level, the minatorial level. High accuracy, two and a half tenths over 12 inches. I use this thing once, if not twice a year, and anytime I use fixturing, just because my machines go out of level. And if you're gonna put a, a machine in the garage like I did, you're most likely gonna only have four inch floors, probably gonna be cracked. And you're gonna have to keep your machines level to, you know, accuracy, get them, keep them trammed and like keep away the vibration. I'd rather have this, spend $550 on this than, you know, call my supplier, a machine supplier out to always level my machine. Especially if I'm gonna do fixturing, like sometimes I'll re-level the machine and tram the machine in just before I do like custom fixturing because I'm a firm believer, your fixturing has to be more accurate than your parts in general, just because it's the foundation of what everything is built off of. So we have some inspection stuff in here. I can't keep it all out. So we have some pin gauge sets and your standard stuff that you need to run a machine shop. Having a gauge block set is super important in a little machine shop, especially if you're trying to measure stuff. It's the only way to do accurate stuff, especially if you don't have accurate uh, height gauges. You just use 
the gauge block set to set your indicator off of or whatever. And that way you can get within tenths pretty easily uh, for checking heights and stuff like that. So I have this granite. It's not a great granite, but it works j just fine. But I have this pink granite, which is more accurate. This was my uncle's too that he had. Uh, you just keep this underneath here. And yeah, so that is the inspection area. Not too crazy. One day I'll have a CMM, but um, it'll do. All right, on to where I keep my spare carbide for all my tool assemblies. My favorite thing is opening these things. Watch me not be able to open. I like the feeling of it. That's nice. I don't know anything about this. <laughs> I have my drills up here. Um, little Makita charger. But I try and keep everything, like one of everything, unless it's like something I can get in a day, then I don't, I'm trying to be money conscious. But for the most part, some random stuff that it take me a couple days to get or have to order. One day I'll have enough room to have a list of cabinet, but for right now, it's a cheap way to do it. So this is the rack that I keep all my extra parts on that if I build overstock, I have a customer that allows me to do that. Actually, they don't allow me, I just do it because I know they're gonna order again. So basically the only reason I'm showing you this is because the bins, I actually use these bins for my own myself just to keep parts in, but also I ship, I ship in these bins. So I don't have to buy like perishable boxes or stuff like that for one particular customer. I just drive them over there, they're local, and then they take their parts out and then I uh, take the bins back. So it works really well. Kind of want to show you guys this. I know people are get like, they super freak out when they see really nice bins. So there you go. For all the guys that love bins, did this one for you. All right, so part of my business model was to make my own products. And to do that, I had to buy a scanner, a 3D scanner, a 700 Elite, a Creaform 3D scanner, blue laser. I bought this with the intent to make my own my own brand, uh, reverse engineer thing. I ended up buying uh, Geomagic as well. I, it was a big investment, but I felt it was the best time to do it early on in my, uh, my business, just because I think if I got too busy doing other people's stuff, I never ever do my own stuff. So that's why I bought the lathe, why I bought this. I have a full solution now to, to go that direction. And if it fires off, I make some products that people like, and it starts, I start to build a brand. I don't have to chase any more work. I don't have to do that job shop work that everybody stresses about. And then I can really hone in on how to, you know, make those products and just be super efficient. I think it's just a really awesome way to have, have a shop. I would love to have my own uh, products and just enjoy life. You know, that's the goal. That is the business goal. So yeah, my 3d scanner. So to power that 3d scanner, I had to buy a laptop. Um, this is an investment as well, <laughs> but this little laptop, this little Dell, this thing is fire because it's it's got it's pretty packed with some good stuff in here. It's a 64 gig RAM. Uh, it's got an RTX 85500 GPU, which is nicer than the TI that I have inside. What I do is I have both of these. Both of these are in waterproof cases. If I have to go anywhere and scan anything, I have this full uh, mobile solution to be able to do that. So my programming flow, I typically program the bulk of it inside my house, and then when I'm running machines in here. If I don't need to prove it out, I'll bring this, I'll bring this uh, laptop out and end up uh, just finishing it off, you know? Because being a single monitor is drives me insane. I cannot program off a single monitor. I can if it's a little bit, but ultimately it's, it's hard to do for me. I mean, I have a, a 3D mouse on this one and my computer in there, so it does help, but I like to have all my tabs like docked on the other, on the other monitor. So yeah, that's kind of how I do that. Makes it a little bit, more efficient. You know, I'd love to have a shop where I can program right beside the machines or some, at least an office that's close, but right now we just got to do what we have to do. All right. So this is our lathe toolbox. What do we have in there, Nina? This looks like a Frisbee. <laughs> yeah, that is some a Frisbee. Some boxes. Soft jaws in here, a bunch of different stuff. Bar puller, um, some static holders, base pie jaws right in there. All right. What's on the next drawer? My bed. <laughs> I sleep here. We have some collets in there. Those are standard sizes to use. Probably get more. Probably square stock. Probably end up doing that. I don't know what these are either. Some live tooling holders. Ooh. I have uh, five of these total, three of these. These are earplugs, so I don't have to listen to Sean talk. This is super cold. My buddy got me this. Basically, you put this in the collet and you put your indicator at the end so you can actually dial in your live, live tools without having to you know, pull the call it out or whatever. You have a couple different sizes you can do. It's random carbide, nothing crazy. 
These are those things that loosen up the collet, right? Yep. Yeah. Some collets in there. I'm so good. I have no idea what that is. Is it a European battery or plug? A plug-in? It's my Royal Collet Chuck Quick Clamp. So machinist handbook. Only reason why I have a machinist handbook is for threading. <laughs> that is the only reason why I look into a machinist handbook. All that's right, so fun. that's a lathe toolbox right there. Nothing fun. It is the newest edition though. Yep, it is the newest edition. Mm -hmm. Hopefully one day I'll have all those boxes in here. Yeah. When I have space, but for right now. It's all we got. Yep. So I figure I'd start with my newest machine purchase that I purchased in July. It's an SC20Y lathe, has Y-axis, live tooling, BMT65 turret. I didn't even have any work when I bought this machine. I just knew that I needed a mill and I didn't, I couldn't afford both. Plus I couldn't put a mill and another lathe in here. So I, my thought process was to buy a lathe. That way I could do the full solution. I wanted to be able to do anything I wanted to do, um, lathe, mill. And that way I wasn't turning down work. And I, if I wanted to make my own brand of product, I had a lathe. But for right now, it kind of just sits here. It just uh, watches these two work. Actually, it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a manager. It's got this new clipboard right here and it just jogs down notes, make sure these two are working. So, <laughs> and that's no dig on any manager of mine. I've, uh, I've always appreciated all my managers. Even myself is a little bit difficult to deal with. It's like a devil on one side and an angel on the other. Not much else to talk about it. Going to talk about the old machine, a little more history in that. And uh, there you go. All right, so this is the first machine that I ever put in my shop. It's a 2001 VF OE. It is a belt drive, not gearbox. If you ever buy an older machine, these are great machines. Belt drive, they do not they do not break down like those old gearboxes did. Not as much horsepower, but I do mostly aluminum, and honestly, I hog pretty heavy with it, and it does just fine. So, yeah, I ended up pushing it for my dad. He, uh, it wasn't for a deal. I ended up paying a little more just because I felt bad. <laughs> but basically, I ran this machine at his place. I would program and do all his uh, parts and set them up, fixturing, and then he would run them, and then I would uh, do my own parts, and he would run them, and I would just pay him you know, a certain percentage. So I wasn't very serious about it. He wanted to quit, sell the machine. He was like moving out of the shop. I'm like, let's just throw it in my garage. I'll, I'll pay you for it. And at that point I still, you know, had a career that I was going elsewhere. I was getting paid, you know, decent money. So it was really hard for me to think about even starting my own shop. Um, but yeah, this thing's been great. As you can see, I have all the tools that I need. Both, both machines are set up identical. So that's one of the reasons why uh, you'll see later that I kept everything the same because I wanted to be able to put both jobs, run both programs, and that's super beneficial uh, management-wise for me as a, a solo person here. I don't have to manage two different types of programs and machinery and, and fixturing. So I have all my Allen wrenches. I have a taster here and Allen wrenches here. I have you know a drill gun just to do quick stuff for my you know pit bull clamps, tool tag holders. Uh, have some stones, basically some more like a hammer. You know, everything is equipped the same way in my other machine. So that way I can just, you know, go over there. It's no big deal. I have a calculator on both machines on the side to do offsets. And, uh, you know, if a salesman comes in here, you gotta, they're trying to sell you something, you gotta make sure that you're getting a deal, you know? So calculator, you gotta call them out sometimes. So yeah, and then I have some lube for my spindle. So to keep the spindle from sticking, I use like Molly Coat BG20. It's really thin or I'll use Lana Lube. It's a little thicker. You gotta put it on thin on the taper and it keeps it from sticking for a while. You gotta redo it, but that's the story behind this machine. It's been great and it's kind of fired off my business. And I've actually noticed I have air handlers in all my machines and that's because when a small shop, it gets very thick of coolant smoke, especially when you're roughing pretty heavy and it's really hard on your lungs. So I, I run that. It does get a little swampy in here. Uh, it's just something I have to circulate the air every once in a while, but breathing wise, like it's, it's so much better. So we'll go on to the next machine and I'll show you a little bit more about, um, get it more into the fixturing. Cause I do have a, you know, a fixture plate on here that I, I made out of 7075, had it ground and just made it myself out of car lane bushings and uh, key inserts. So, so this is my 2019 BF2 that I bought in the uh, end of 2019. So it almost, I almost didn't get delivered till 2020, but we got it in in 2019. I basically bought this identical to this one. No probe, umbrella carousel, no high speed spindle. I do have high speed look ahead on here, which is beneficial. And then I have fourth axis enabled. The thought process behind that for me, especially a one man show, it is so much better to have two, two spindles versus one fast spindle. There's, there's no comparison. 
you know, I could have bought, I had enough money to buy a nicer one, but I didn't want to like change the programs. I just want to run the same programs, just identical. And that's just like, you know, in the future, I'll be obviously getting better equipment and I'll have a probe. I, I love probes, but you know, I didn't need it when I have modular fixed string and stuff like that. We'll go into that a little bit later. So when I purchased this machine, that is when I knew I was actually going to quit my day job. I'm like, I need to go after it. So that's what I did. I basically purchased this and then until I quit my day job, I just worked both machines as hard as I could, tried to pay them off the best I could. And actually, just before I quit my day job, I ended up buying this uh, Martin Trinian. This is what was able to, you know, pay my way to quit because I had a job that I wanted to do. I couldn't do it. I didn't have a fourth axis to do it. I actually really needed a five axis, but I wasn't going to put a five axis in here. But it is what allowed me to like go on my own. Uh, just because of the jobs I was able to grab with it. And uh, yeah, it ran probably for a good year straight on one particular job and <laughs> I couldn't be thankful enough. It's been flawless, you know, the hydraulic brake. It's it's really, really good, super rigid. Like, so, so hopefully you made it this far because we're gonna go into fixturing, tooling, uh, tool assemblies and work instructions. This is my favorite part of the whole tour because setup is everything in a shop, especially if you're a one man show. You have to set up fast because you have to program, you have to get programs out. Um, if you're constantly setting up a machine, your throughput just fails. And out of anything, in any shop I've ever been in, this is the biggest waste and the biggest headache to deal with. A lot of that was from guys like me back in the early days that didn't know what they're doing and we didn't really have the software to do it, but now we do. So hopefully you enjoy this because this is my favorite part. All right, so the first thing that I do after I've proven out a part is I make the work instructions. I don't do it before because it's like I always change stuff. Uh, I wanna have employees someday, so I make sure that I do my work instructions pretty thorough. That way when I do hire on, looking into the future, you know, I can do that. Plus it's the process, and if I ever get AS9100, you know, you have a process of work instructions, and stuff like that. So this is a typical work instruction that I have here. This is the cover page. This is just taped up top because company uh, information, but Cover page shows what the, the product is and uh, the vice and where it sits on the table. If you turn the page here, I have an actual, it's some of the G code that's on here. I can see the work offset uh, tools. I can, I can see what's going on. And then also on the bottom here that you can see, there is a uh, program rev. So if I ever change that program in the file folder, it'll actually give me a rev right here, which is pretty cool. And then I have a stock. This is my stock, how I set up my stock, how do I stop my stock, and just where it sits on the vise and, and stuff like that. So here we have the tool list. So the tool list, I basically have the tool, what it is, uh, the tool number, the assembly number, what pot it goes into. I have the holder name, the holder manufacturer, the carbide name, and the, the EDP number for the code to, to reorder. So it has the image of the tool holder, the gauge length, uh, the stick out, even though that information is over here. You can see it pretty visually, and I make sure that my stick outs and gauge length are probably within 10 thou of the actual assembly that I have in my, my programming. I come from a background of uh, five axis programming, uh, a lot of verification, and if your stuff isn't right, you can have rubbing and you have a lot of problems when you go through verification. So you wanna, I always make sure that's close. A lot of people don't do that, but for me, I want everything you know, pretty good. So this is where I keep my job packet. I hang them on the machine right here. You can buy these at Uline, but I'll have my, you know, setup sheets, um, router if you had one, or just all the stuff that pertains to the job uh, in this sheath right here. So anything like that, anything you want, you just put it in this little, little tag and it just hangs off the machine all the way. So all these tools that I have are basic for jobs over and over. They're most, they're all for aluminum. I have some steel down here that only, actually here, these only run on steel, but I mostly do aluminum. Having tool assemblies and then I use them on multiple jobs. It's so nice to have them set up because you don't have to have to break them down. Like it's expensive, but at the same time, it, it saves you so much money and time. I just decided early on, like this is how I'm gonna do it. And I spent all my money on tooling. That's all it went to. I never really made a profit on the first initial jobs because I just wanted to make tooling out of it. I try and go cheap on some of my tools. You know, I just use side lock holders. They're fine. You know, I have 8,100 RPM spindle. Uh, some stuff I use milling chucks, like a Nick and milling chuck, or these really nice um, hydraulic holders from uh, Kinemetal, the Ericsson holders. These things are great. You know, I, I spend the money where I can and, you know, where I need it, I guess. Not where I can, but how I need it. And, yeah, it keeps keeps the cost down a little bit, but 
This is my favorite spot. Okay, so my work instruction says tool one is uh, number assembly number 28. So take the tag off, put it in here, tool one position. I just made these actual tags. I used to use a bucket to hold my tool tags for <laughs> years and years, uh, even at the old shops we did. But I saw this on Saunders on his YouTube channel. He made one and then I think Pearson made some too and I just made my own rendition, had my buddy print them out on a new uh, bamboo printer and uh, it works pretty sweet. I've been wanting to do that for a long time so I'm glad I was able to do it before this uh, video. Uh, it makes me a little more professional. So take tool two, assembly number 65 and there you go. Load the tools in there. Okay, so this is where I do things a little bit differently than most shops. I start my tool assemblies at number 21 and they go up from there. I only have 20 tool positions in my carousel. That's why I started at 21. So the first 20 offsets, if I ever wanted to put anything or do some prototyping and didn't have a tool offset or a tool assembly, I just throw the tool in there and I can use those offsets and I won't overwrite what's in there. But that's the trick. I am using tool one with uh, assembly number 28. So it's gonna be tool one, height 28, diameter 28. All my heights and diameters are the same as the assembly number. I only have 200 offsets in this machine. I wish Haas would give the option to give you more offsets. They only offer that in the UMC. But most, most other machines have over a thousand um, or even more. So that's what I do. That is the trick. I never ever have to set off tools when I put them in the machine. I just fire it up and go. It's like, yeah, you could put them in the wrong spot and you could have some problems, but I haven't have happened yet. And uh, if I do ever have a machine that's got a probe on it or something, I can always come down and check it. But onto the fixed ring. So this over here is the rack where I keep my vices, um, both double station, single station, and my all my soft jaws and hard jaws and stuff like that. Can't really get a camera in here to show you, so I'll bring some of the stuff on the bench and we'll kind of go through what I do uh, to do the modular fixturing. So this is what I did to pin my vices to my subplates on the machine. Both, both of these vices are different heights, so I wanted to make sure the decks were the same height. So what I did was I made these subplates right here out of 7075 aluminum hard anodized with bushings. And this deck height is actually different for each vice by maybe a thou. And these two vices are, I think were off a quarter inch. So I made them all the same height all the way across within, I would say three tenths. So if I have different vices on here, either this one or this one, I can run a bar all the way across and it won't interfere or hit this if it's, if it's too long. So that helped me out. And plus these intersect like so, so they can get really tight. You can run an eight inch vice jaws on each one. That helps me a ton to like set up the job. So anything that's I've set up in the machine will match anything in my CAD. So I can just put it in there, set it in the center. I can shift it two inches if I want, just change the offset off two inches because I program everything off center. And that's how I deal with that. Uh, speaking of programming, I program everything off the center of the table and off the, the table itself. So all my Z offsets are, all the tools are set off the table. It's so much easier to do it that way because you know, you have one offset and then if I have to shift, if I move my vice left or right, I just put negative two in my offset or positive two or positive eight. It's always gonna be two inches. Plus I don't ever have to edge find. I never edge find. My offset's always in there. G55, 56, 57, they're all the same, but I may tweak them like a thou here, a thou there, because everything should be, when I put these on the table, they should be within about a thou and a half of each other. I do the same thing for my trinium table here. I have the subplate here, it gets pinned here and here and then bolted to the table and it works just fine. I can load this thing up within a thou across that whole 20 inches um, that way parallel uh, every time. I mean, one time I threw it up there with two tents run out. <laughs> I, was, I was pretty stoked. So that allows me to run multiple jobs on the same, uh, same machine. I can run ops ones, two, uh, three, if I have three vices in there all at once, or I can run op one, op two here. And then sometimes I'll run three vices with op one in it if I want to have long run time, because most of the time op one is the longest uh, um, run time. So maybe I'll run two op ones on these two machines, um, maybe different jobs. And that way I get a huge amount of runtime and then I can go program. And then the next day I can, if I have short runners, I'll just run both machines and waste that day on just running machines. I don't program at all. So it'd be super dynamic to do that. I'll basically just call up a sub program, any program I want to loop together. I'll just put a sub program like, you know, M98 P1000, if that's my program number with uh, uh, G55 and a G56 with so M98 P2000 for op two or something like that. And then both those two can run uh, as long as I have enough tools in the tool carousel. <laughs> but uh, that, then I can get that extra long run time. It, yeah, it's a little bit more tool change time, but 
I don't really care. As long as I can program, that's what matters. In the future, if I have uh, better machines and more money, I'll probably get a Unilog system with air actuated, something like that. Um, it's just, you gotta do what you can afford. And this is what I could afford at the beginning. And these two machines will just run this and uh, hopefully I'll have a probe on my next machine and they will be a little more advanced. But for now, this is how I do it and uh, works pretty good. So here we have my uh, catch-all utility shelf. Yep. What's on here, Nina? Got some bolt bins. Uh, bolt bins, that's always nice. Miscellaneous bolts. Yeah, so I have a few bolts, metric, American, just for fixturing. Yep. Um, Various sprays. Ooh, sprays, what kind of spray is that? Corrosion inhibitor. Yeah, that's always good to have. Corrosion inhibitor, I put it below my plates or vices or fixturing that go on my table so they don't rust. Some REM stock that I have, just drops, basic drops. Then we got some soft jaws. Ooh, soft jaws. Soft jaws. Ooh, yeah. So the difference in this, my these soft jaws I made, it's just cheaper to, to make them for me. Um, and also I make them a little bit wider so I can put the six inch pocket in there. So that way when it goes on the vise, it locks into place on the dead jaw. It helps out because it matches everything in my CAD system. That way I can locate it without indicating or anything like that. So little hack, works pretty good. Um, yeah. So that is the utility rack. So this is my toolbox. Your toolbox. Yep, mine. You don't know that I take tools from here all the time to fix <laughs> things that I break, <laughs> Okay. which I do a lot. So this is just some mechanic tools in there. Actually, this drawer is probably the most important drawer as far as machining goes. This is a compass. Uh, no. <laughs> probably the most important thing in here is the, sh the shim stock. You have a lot of shim stock. If you're in a machine shop, it's really nice to have shim stock. That way you can get your your parts flat or vices flat or fixturing flat or who knows a line of spindle. Yeah, that's the, that is the toolbox. Not much else to really show in there. All right, so here we have my tool cart that I've made like 20 years ago. Why you give us a show of what's in the boxes, Nina? Torture devices for fingers. Oh yeah, that can work. Some, <laughs> some DA collets, probably never ever use those, but they'll probably just collect dust and die in there. Uh, just some more collets. Nuts, washers, pretty much, yeah, T-slot, nuts, some bolts, uh, studs, typical stuff. Junk drawer, don't show it. What Tool. else do we have on here? These are tools. Tools? Yep. That's For what? A, that's a crescent wrench. Yeah? Yep. Is it metric or American? Sure. This is used when Sean annoys me. So it's got some ER collet chuck wrenches and then milling chuck wrenches, so everything you need to like remove tools and stuff. Okay, what's below, Nina? Angle plates. Angle plates? How'd you know that was an angle plate? Because you told me it was. <laughs> All right. Good, you know your lines. <laughs> so this angle plate I made out of 7075. It's the same grid pattern as on the machine. I have two of them. I can put them on either machine. You look at the bottom, I have a little bushing. You can pin it both sides. Um, pins to the table. I know exactly where it is in my CAD, so it makes it really easy to uh, do angle plate work. Not that I do a lot of that, but. All right, so what do we have over here? Paper towels. Paper towels? Paper no, towels. we have a 3D printer. This is a 3D printer. Yeah, what does it print? Things in 3D. <laughs> okay, that's good. All right, this is my Mark Forge Mark II printer. It does continuous carbon fiber. Onyx can do some PLA in there. Uh, continuous Kevlar fiberglass. Uh, what's in here? Heat sink inserts. Yeah, we have some inserts in there. Make sure your stuff doesn't get ripped out when you're testing the product. But um, there's some parts right here that I've tested. And we probably had 20 iterations of this to test um, different profiles and stuff. And it was really nice. I didn't have to make any fixturing or machine them. Just basically could test them. Then we did a final design and was able to print them out or uh, machine them out. Worked out really well. So yeah, that is my 3D printer. So you're probably wondering where my saw is to cut material and I don't have a saw. I don't have a bandsaw. I wish I did, but I don't have room for a bandsaw in here. And even if I did get a bandsaw, it would be a horizontal, you know, auto saw. And this is a lot of money to, to put up front, you know, in a little business like this. And uh, so basically what I do is I have my uh, supplier, my material supplier cut all my stuff because it's, I usually do about 50 to 400 piece cuts, you know, at a time. So the price is like super cheap. And the best thing about someone else cutting your material is it's always, always clean. There's no chips on it. If I do need to cut something, obviously I use this, but I have like 12 foot lengths of bar that are kind of like my uh, soft jaw size. 
our fixture size. I just have some random stuff. I can buy rims or whatever. And then I just go grab it and I'll just chop right through it and I can make my custom fixture if I need it. But that's how I get around uh, not spending a lot of money on a saw and uh, getting my stuff cut. So just wanted to show this because it is kind of important. It is messy, but you know, it's, it's worth it. So I thought it'd be a good idea to address some of the questions I get on Instagram instead of me repeating it all the time. It's really hard, you know, but these are like the common, the common questions I get. So hopefully, um, if, if someone ever asks this question again, I'm going to direct them to this, uh, YouTube video. When were you ready to quit your day job? How did you know? It's because I gained like 20 pounds and the best way to lose weight is to stress about money and go on your own. <laughs> so basically I worked a uh, day shift at a, at a company every night. Once I figured out I wanted to be on my own, it was probably three or four years. I worked every night moonlighting and on the weekends mostly, and just, uh, just went after it as hard as I could to pay down my machines, get another machine. I knew I wanted two machines before I quit and I wanted to max out at least one of them uh, and have an, or have enough money to have uh, the other machine and be able to pay for that and not be stressed out. Part of the reason why it was hard for me to leave is because I was getting paid a decent amount of money and it was pretty comfortable. I didn't want to stop riding my dirt bike. <laughs> so um, once I figured, okay, I'm going to have to you know, go away from the social situations for a little bit and work really hard, when I was able to get a raise, when I was going to have an interview or not an interview, but you know, a performance review to get a raise, I negotiated. I just told them straight up, I go, I don't want a raise. What I want is uh, time off. So I want the same amount um, of time off to equate the raise I was going to get. They met me halfway, which is good. So what I did was uh, any t vacation time I had, I would work a full week making my fixturing or, you know, I'd have everything lined up prior to that. And I would just work and do everything I needed to do to be super efficient. So when I was able to uh, quit on the specific day that I had in my head, uh, everything was going to be lined up. All I had to do was just go after it. And so that's kind of that's kind of my thought. It is the long game. I know a lot of a lot of people want to hear that because they just want to get done and do it. But the last thing I wanted to do was try and chase work, try and make payments, and it just it's way too stressful for me. I, I'm not that way. Um, so yeah, that's how I kind of got here. It's uh, I probably could have done it earlier, but with all that experience that I had at the other shops, it's it's helped me, you know, do what I needed to do. And in the future, I know it's going to help me a ton. So probably the second biggest question I get on Instagram is, how do you get work? I don't know. I wish you guys could tell me because <laughs> it's mostly luck. <laughs> no, it's not mostly luck. I think a lot of it is uh, reputation, and then just the connections that you make, whether it be Instagram or all through your career. Uh, all those connections, like it's like, how do you get your foot in the door in a, to a company? And it's usually because you know somebody or you impress somebody. And for me, I think working all the um, machine shops that I did, I always made a point to talk to all the you know tool salesmen that came in, to talk to all the uh, apps engineers and um, machine uh, sellers, just all those guys. And also, they were able to see my work as well, so they knew what I was capable of, and that was a good word of mouth. Um, to be able to ask them if I like, Hey, you have any work or can I go find another job or something like that? So they, they were able to refer me to other people. Um, I do feel though that if I had to get work now, I would probably just go to different shops and see if they had any overflow. But I feel if you don't have your AS9100, you're going to be hurting yourself a little bit. You're just going to be getting the bottom feeder stuff. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much all I have to say about it. So, I figured I'd just uh, lay all that out there and just puke it all, all in this uh, one video. So I hope that helped out. If not, maybe we can go panhandle on the streets if it gets, it gets rough. <laughs> all right, so that's the end of our uh, shop tour, all 896 square feet of it. Um, had a good time. Hope you guys uh, learned some stuff from it. Uh, thank you, Practical Machinist, for letting us do this. Thank I, you. I enjoy making videos just as much as I like, like machining. It's like the artistic side of it. So if you want to see any more of that stuff, head over to SB Solo Co. on Instagram. It's my only page, my only social media page. I try and stay only on that page because it's such a great community. I don't do TikTok, YouTube, or uh, Facebook. So if you guys ever see a reel, you head over there and, or a story and you have questions, I try and reply to everybody. I get a lot of DMs and I try and reply. A lot of the stuff, content I did here was questions that I had in my DMs. And so hopefully that'll help other people out. Take it easy. Bye.